I was an officer in the Royal Marines for eight and a half years. As you can probably imagine, I did my fair share of actual war fighting and counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan. But my career in the armed forces also had me doing things you'd more commonly associate with the police. Because the Marines are part of the Royal Navy, we specialize in amphibious warfare. We train with fast boats, ship to shore insertions via helicopter, scaling cliff faces from boats, that sort of thing. If it goes on water, we train with it. So when the British government needed someone to do a job in the sunny Caribbean, they chose us for it. And when I heard from a mate of mine that we were shipping out to the Caribbean, I thought he was just messing with me. We'd just done six months in Helmand the year before, a winter tour too, so it was absolutely freezing sometimes, especially at night. So the idea of going on operations in one of the world's number one holiday destinations had a huge appeal to it. And I'll admit that when I learned exactly what we'd be doing, I got way more excited than I probably should have. We'd been hunting Taliban and Iraqi insurgents for the past few years, but in the Caribbean, we'd be hunting drug smugglers. The way it was explained to me was that the British government wanted to curtail the amount of cocaine being smuggled into the UK. Since we had a lot of diplomatic ties with the Caribbean members of the Commonwealth, we could get freedom to operate in their waters, which also happened to be used by some of the busiest drug smugglers in the world. If we could cut them off nearer the source, it would be much harder for them to get product across the Atlantic. Although operations would be much less aggressive in terms of applied lethal force, it promised to be much more fast-paced, which after months at a time dodging IEDs sounded like a much welcome change of pace. So, for the first few weeks of deployment, we practiced rapid deployment with the fast boats, trained with the specialist weapons we'd be using, stuff like that. And then came the first couple of interdictions, where we raced out towards a supposed fishing vessel, most of the actual fishermen having got two pennies to rub together, let alone enough money for a top-of-the-line outboard motor. Searched it, confiscated any drugs, then moved on. Most of the time the blokes with the drugs on them are just couriers on some terrible wage, so the last thing they want to be doing is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with marine commandos. It just wasn't worth losing their lives over. So generally speaking, sailors on guilty vessels would just give up as soon as we showed up, which honestly suited us down to the ground. As much as we like a scrap, I often think of the ancient warrior poet, Ice Cube, who said, if the day does not require the use of an AK, it is good. 90% of all the interdictions we made were completely non-violent, and around 40% of those involved actual narcotic seizures. But out of all the ops we pulled in the Caribbean, only one really sticks with me, because it's the only one where things actually turn nasty. A big part of any interdiction action was making sure we had a representative from whatever nation's waters we were using, making it a proper joint task force instead of just the British ragging it round the Caribbean and nicking people's powder. And while we were based in Barbados, that person was Chief Inspector Raggy Mason. I have no idea how he got the name of Raggy, and it didn't exactly fill me with confidence when the head of the local police introduces himself with a nickname. But Raggy proved me wrong spectacularly by proving to be a diligent, hard-working, and shrewd practitioner of the law. If I was a resident of Bridgetown, I'd sleep a lot better knowing Raggy was on the beat. Working side by side in those conditions, it's hard not to get attached to people. When you risk your lives together, even when admittedly there's not all that much of a risk, it forms that band of brothers style bond. Cliched, I know, but some things get that cliche status for a reason because they're like a universal truth or something. The point is, despite all the Scooby-Doo jokes, we liked Raggy, and Raggy liked us, which made it all the more difficult to stomach what happened to us next. So, we're hanging around below deck when we get the word that we're on an interdiction op. We leg it topside with all of our kit, pile into one of the fast boats, and then we let rip across the Caribbean Sea towards where our radar had picked up the target vessel. First thing I noticed, when the boat came into view, 
was that it was much bigger than our usual fodder. We normally go after what are called cigarette boats, thin, lightweight, high-speed crafts that are perfectly suited to just bombing it to shore and back as quickly as possible. But the one that appeared on the horizon was massive in comparison, with a much larger hold along with a little bridge for the captain. We knew they'd spotted us when we saw a small motorized dinghy speeding away from the vessel itself, which is common practice when well-to-do smugglers are on board. So we figured we'd made quite a big bust and the mood shifted up to reflect that. So, once we'd properly identified ourselves, the blokes on the boat reluctantly allowed us to board. They kept insisting they were just fishermen and to be fair, they probably were. Smugglers are quick to leg it when we turn up. The actual fisherman who owns the boat? Not so much. Once we'd secured the deck, we found the entrance to the hold and dropped down inside. Raggy went in first, torch in hand, and although we had our weapons at hand, I'll admit we really didn't think we'd be using them. So as much as we went in tactically, it wasn't anything like the white knuckle room clearances we'd done in Iraq and Afghan. Now picture the hold of this boat. It's quite big, but still not large enough to fully stand up in, and everything is stacked haphazardly in three rough rows, leaving two little corridor-type spaces for us to move down. We'd spotted two pieces of cargo that seemed ideal for smuggling. One set of big boxes labeled Material de Peche, fishing equipment, and a set of large oil drums that appeared to contain fuel. The drums definitely had some kind of fluid in them, but that didn't mean they didn't have vacuum-sealed bundles of narcotics in them too. However, since it had taken longer to search them than the boxes, we agreed to secure those first before we moved back to the drums. As usual, Raggy was point man, all so we could tell the international community that this was a Bayesian-led operation. He shuffles down one of the makeshift corridors until he reaches the stacked boxes. Then he leans forward and peers around the back of them to check if there's anything concealed between them and the bulkhead. I watch as his eyes go wide, having obviously seen something. But before he can react... I just see this flash of steel in the light of our torches before Raggy collapses forward. I just start unloading into the boxes, trying to put rounds into whoever is hidden behind them to ambush Raggy. A second later, the hidden attacker then falls forward, with more holes in him than a cheese grater. Now, we're in twice the trouble, because not only is one of our blokes severely wounded, but the bullet holes mean the vessel is in serious danger of sinking. Not immediate danger, but from the look of the leaks in the wooden hall, it had maybe an hour or two before it'd be listing, four or five before it sank entirely. This is if it wasn't towed into port and repaired, sharpish. At this point, you have to keep in mind that once I saw someone attack Raggy, I just reacted and neutralized the immediate threat. I didn't actually see how hurt he was. I just saw the attack. My torch beam is focused on the boxes and almost... Everything else in the hold is plunged back into darkness. Once we're certain the threat is gone, I start going to check on Raggy. I shine my torch and I see Raggy's face. His eyes are wide open, that look of shock in them still clear as day and there's a little bit of blood around his lips, so I know he's not in a good way. Then I notice the amount of blood on the deck, and then I notice the thing that's haunted me ever since that Raggy's head wasn't attached to his body anymore. It was just lying there next to the stump of his neck, which was still absolutely gushing with blood. His attacker must have brought his machete right through his neck, meaning they'd kept it abominably sharp. Add that to the fact that they were just hiding there when they could have gotten away in the dinghy, or at least pretended to be a fisherman, and the conclusion you get is that this monster literally just wanted to kill some policemen or marines. Usually we take a casualty on operations. There's a pretty standard procedure we'd go through. Secure the area, give first aid, that sort of thing. But it wasn't like it was just a gunshot wound to the leg. Something we could whack a tourniquet on after applying a bit of pressure. Raggy was brown bread properly. There was just nothing we could do for him. We obviously had to hang around for a medevac and... All that, 
getting both bodies off the ship before we arrested blokes on board. Only then could we search the hold, which by that time was already filling up with seawater that mixed with Raggy's blood. Once that was done, it wasn't any of our business anymore. We headed back to the ship while other Royal Navy personnel took over and tugged the fishing boat into port somewhere. Had a debrief, went over where we went wrong, and the OC told me I'd be offered the Royal Navy's own special brand of trauma counseling once we got back to the UK. But other than that, I was left just to process the sudden decapitation of someone I'd come to care about immensely. It was grim, and to an extent it's just the nature of the job. But even on my Iraq and Afghan deployments, I'd never seen anything quite like Raggy's severed head, just lying there on the deck of the hold. What do you think of when someone mentions Cuba? Probably cigars, the missile crisis thing, all those cars from the 50s they have, maybe even Cubano music like Buena Vista Social Club. But whenever I hear the word Cuba, I think of my old neighbor, Ricardo. Ricardo, or Ricky as he insisted on being called, lived in the apartment above me in Miami when I was working down there. He and his boyfriend would often spend their evenings on the little balcony area near their apartment's front door, and whenever they caught me returning home from work, they'd always, always offer me a daiquiri or a saoco. A daiquiri I could turn down, but a saoco? No way. For those that don't know, a saoco is like a rum cocktail made with coconut water. The first sip, you're like, huh, this is new. Not sure if I like it, but it's new. Second sip is like, hmm, okay, I'm getting into this. And by the third sip, you're like, this is my life now. Viva la vida de Saoco. So there was me, Irish-American Long Islander, chilling with the gay neighbors for a few hours every week. The conversation never really advanced past small talk, and I was only ever truly engaged whenever they were giving me hints on how to pick up cubanitas. So, it's not like we talked about anything too heavy. But one day, my curiosity got the better of me, and I started asking Ricky about Cuba. Most Cubans will immediately smile when you ask them about La Patria, or the homeland. Even with all the crazy stuff that's happened there, they'll tell you how much they miss it, about family they left behind. Like you get a general sense that it's a messed up country, but they still kind of love it, you know? A concept that won't seem all that alien to most Americans I know either. But not Ricardo. Ricardo didn't have a single good word to say about Cuba, and immediately that struck me as strange. Maybe I should have just minded my own business. It's not exactly the politest or well-meaning conversation to be like, yo, tell me all your childhood traumas, bruh. But I couldn't help myself. I mean, sure, I wanted to get to know my neighbors a little bit better, but I also wanted to know what happened to make a Cuban, of all people, display such contempt for their country of origin. When I finally asked the fateful question of how did he end up moving to the US, Ricardo sighed, and his boyfriend Andrew immediately got up to top up their drinks, almost like he knew what was coming. And so, he starts telling me his story. I'll do my best to remember exactly what he said, and if he happens to be reading this and notices I got some details wrong, I'm so sorry, amigo. I'll do my best. Ricardo was just 19 in the late 50s, a young man living in Havana who found that he wasn't like other girls, Ricardo's words, not mine. He said life wasn't great for a young gay man, as Latin culture has always been very masculine oriented, but it also wasn't bad either. Havana was a hedonistic place and it was relatively easy for him to blend into the party scene. He worked as a bartender and fixer for a lot of the wealthy Americans that came over, and even says he met Sammy Davis Jr. one night, before he got super famous with the Rat Pack. So as I said, life was pretty good for Ricky. It wasn't like there was a pride parade every year, and Ricardo still had trouble having his family accept him when they became aware of his standing in life, but he had a regular boyfriend and his prospects of moving up the employment chain were quite high from what he told me. But then came the revolution. 
and that changed everything. By Ricardo's own admission, he fully supported the revolution at first. Cuba for the Cubans. It made total sense, especially when a brutal dictator had turned the capital city into a playground for American mobsters. Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano spent a lot of time down there because the Batista government was more bribable than a Mexican cop and gave them free reign to run whatever scams they wanted. So at first, Ricardo was all for the 26th of July boys. The revolutionaries didn't call themselves communists or socialists back then, and celebrated the revolutionary victory in 1959. But as the revolutionaries took full control, their promises of a free Cuba turned out to only apply to certain groups of people, and sadly, the LGBT community wasn't one of them. Ricardo said things didn't turn sour overnight, more like that the homophobia that already existed became more overt. Before, homosexuality wasn't exactly celebrated, but it was definitely tolerated. But now, with Castro in power, things like long or extravagant hairstyles, tight pants, colorful shirts, or even what were called effeminate mannerisms were seen as indicators that a man was gay, and they were strongly encouraged to correct themselves, quote-unquote. No one was kicking your door in and dragging you away if you were gay, but go out in public in your Daisy Dukes and you can get into a lot of trouble if the wrong revolutionaries found you. But then came the Night of the Three Ps. It was meant to be a huge police raid on Havana that targeted three types of individuals. In English, it translated to women of the night, their pimps, and predators that targeted children. Castro unleashed his morality police, and at the time, I mean, who's not going to support it? So the whole thing got tons of support from your average Cuban, especially in rural areas, but the reality of it wasn't so much that they were arresting bad people, they were just picking up anyone who was openly gay and saying they were either a pimp, a hooker, or worse, someone who went after children. Ricardo himself had grown up in a rural area and wasn't as flamboyant as his boyfriend at the time. I guess you could call him Butch these days, as he put it himself. So he was able to basically pass his straight. But his boyfriend, the one who liked to cross-dress at some of the raunchier nightclubs, the revolutionaries literally threw a black bag over his head, broke all of his fingers getting him into cuffs, and he sadly suffered a little accident when the cops bashed his head into the door frame on the way out of the apartment. Only, when people spoke up about the mistreatment of their friends or loved ones at the hands of the police, they were accused of being a counter-revolutionary. Ricardo said that when confronted with it, Castro was totally unapologetic about his homophobia. I dug up this quote to give you an idea. We would never come to believe that a homosexual could embody the conditions and requirements of conduct that would enable us to consider him a true revolutionary, a true communist militant. A deviation of that nature clashes with the concept we have of what a militant communist must be. What does that even mean? According to Fidel, you can't be gay and be a good communist, like those two things are somehow mutually exclusive. Round about the time of La Rampa, an area with lots of nightclubs that were popular with the LGBT community, started being targeted by police as a center for counter-revolutionary activity, Ricardo decided it was time to leave Cuba. Ricardo said that he got out in the 70s, one of the lucky few to do so. But some of his friends weren't so lucky. And that's when I learned about the concentration camps. Ricardo said that his boyfriend was arrested and released a bunch of times on nonsensical charges until the mid-60s when he was arrested by military police and never came back. Not long after, Ricardo heard news about the Unidades Militares de Ayuda a la Producción, or UMAP for short. A rough translation would be military units for helping production and it was presented as a kind of alternative to the regular military service. Those who weren't mentally or physically fit for compulsory service in the Army, Navy, or Air Force could join these units and help the revolution in their own special way. Sounds awesome, right? Well, these things were anything but. Because what the UMAPs really were 
was just a series of prisons for pacifists slash religious people, Jehovah's Witnesses, hippies, conscientious objectors, groups like that. But by far the vast majority of people sent to these camps were gay men. The Cuban government could throw you into one of these camps for three years without charging you, and they did so regularly. Fidel later closed the camps after international outcry at what was basically slave labor camps. But Ricardo's by then ex-boyfriend, they hadn't seen or heard from each other in three years, was forced to undergo aversion therapy. Now I actually misheard Ricardo at first. I thought he said conversion therapy, which as most people know is when you try to turn gay people straight. I'd like to think that most of you can agree that's a cruel and terrible idea, but that's not what Ricardo said. He said aversion therapy which is actually horrifyingly different to conversion therapy in a number of ways. Firstly, aversion therapy isn't really trying to rehabilitate you or whatever. That's off the table. All it intends to do is take something from you and turn it into something you hate. And this is done by showing you images, movies, or audio, or whatever that thing is, and basically torturing you at the same time so that you come to associate whatever thing it is with pain, fear, and sadness. And that's what happened to Ricardo's ex back in Cuba. All while he was trying to start his new life in Miami. They showed him homoerotic images while they subjected him to mock drowning, electroshock torture and beatings. And when I asked Ricardo how he knew all this, if they were separated for so long, and he told me that his ex showed up in Miami in 1980 after the Mario boat lift, Castro basically let a bunch of gay guys out of jail and told them to get on a bunch of boats in Mario Harbor and told everyone that he'd flush the toilets of Cuba. Ricardo said he barely recognized his ex when he saw him. It had been 15 years but he looked like he'd aged about 40. He was broken and couldn't handle being around so many other Cubans and Ricardo said his ex moved up to Ohio not long after. I know this isn't a traditionally scary story, but I've got to be honest and say I think supernatural stuff is kind of dumb. It's not real, so it's not scary. But what happened to Ricardo and his friends? That stuff legit happened. Like I did a bunch of reading about it after I heard, and not a single word of what he told me was exaggerated. I couldn't get the idea of aversion therapy out of my head for days. Like that's basically the same stuff from that Clockwork Orange movie forcing people to watch stuff while you inject them with drugs and stuff or torture them. The idea that you can make someone hate something they used to love or taking love itself out of their lives by making them scared to be intimate with whatever gender they are attracted to. Tell me that's not a living nightmare, seriously. Tell me that's not a fate worse than death. Only, Stephen King didn't just make this stuff up. It actually happened, and I legit can't believe I didn't know more about it until then. Anyway, I hope I did a good job of telling Ricardo's story. I don't really see him being a Redditor, so I'd like to think I'm doing a good thing by getting a story out there. I just can't imagine going through what he and his ex went through. An actual living nightmare. And at the risk of sounding dumb and cheesy, it really makes me appreciate the kind of lives we're free to lead these days. I know society's not perfect, but my god have we come a long way. Be good to each other. Okay, so think back to high school. Were there ever any white kids who thought that they were Rastafarian? You know, unhealthy obsession with Bob Marley, always wearing green, yellow, and red, routinely making comments about smoking the herb or saying bomba clot. Well, if you did know a kid like that, you'll understand what me and my buddy Ryan were like. We were those 420 kids, complete stoners, each determined to start growing dreadlocks at some point, just never quite committing. So imagine my excitement when my parents announced that the destination for 2014's family summer vacation would be Jamaica. We weren't staying anywhere near Kingston, rather nearer a place called Montego Bay on the western side of the island. Not that I minded too much, I was just ecstatic to be visiting Zion for the first time. But my mom and dad weren't dumb. They were looking forward to relaxing at the four-star resort they'd picked out for us, 
and they recognized that I was excited about something entirely different. So before they left, they sat me down and explained that under no circumstances was I to get into any trouble at all. I remember trying to defend myself, but they were right. I was planning on exploring Montego Bay as soon as possible to get myself a connect, and as much as I promised that I wouldn't go looking for ganja, it was a completely empty one, and I was in town just a matter of hours after we landed, sniffing the air for that telltale smell. From what I read on Reddit, walking up to the first dude selling would most likely result in me being horribly ripped off, and that I most definitely didn't want. The best way to get a hookup would be to walk into the quieter, less touristy parts of town, getting friendly with someone then asking them to do you a favor. If you could trust them to buy for you, maybe while giving them a cash incentive, you'd be spending less money and getting way better product than you would otherwise. So, that's exactly what I did. The resort we were at provided complimentary cabs that went into town and back, so I just jumped into one of those and I was on my way to get some of that holy herb. The feeling of excitement I had is only comparable to being a kid on Christmas Eve. I was practically vibrating, a feeling of youthful exuberance that I honestly don't think I've ever felt since. But little did I know, I was making one of the single biggest mistakes of my life. So there's me, wandering out of downtown Montego Bay up into a suburb called Shantytown. I should have probably taken a clue from the name, but over the course of about a 20 minute walk, the scenery just got rough and more rural the further I walked, until by the time I got to Shantytown, the scenery really started to live up to its name. I mean it wasn't exactly tin shacks, but it was definitely a far cry from the shiny touristy friendly areas of Montego Bay, and as you can imagine, it wasn't long until I smelled that telltale funk of the wisdom weed. Like a homing missile, I tracked down its source. I mean, it was kind of like a cartoon or something. Me walking along, sniffing the air, following the increasingly potent aroma. Until suddenly, I round a corner and come face to face with four guys I just assumed were Rastas. They're listening to reggae, smoking dope, passing around a bottle of rum, and all looks like a good time. But as soon as they see me, they're not this, hey man, come sit down, brother, attitude that I'd been expecting. It was pure animosity. The first guy that spoke had such a strong Jamaican accent and spoke in such thick patois that I literally had no idea what he was saying. I just sort of stood there for a minute with my jaw on the floor, realizing I was woefully unprepared for my prospective transaction. Eventually, one of the other guys says something like, he asking for what you doing here, boy. I just stammer something about being a visitor from America, and they just burst out laughing before the same guy says, Makes sense you think you can just walk up into someone else's back garden. I feel like a jerk. So I just apologize and start walking away, but right as I do, they're all like, Nah, nah, white boy, where are you going? We're only playing. So at this point, I think, I'm pretty much back in so I nervously walk back into the guy's yard and take a seat on this small plastic kid-sized stool since it was the only thing there to sit down on. These guys are asking me all kinds of questions, where I'm from, how old I am. Then they get real interested in why I like Bob Marley so much, so I get to explain it and they're kind of half impressed and half making fun, still calling me white boy but now offering me turns on their joint. I run out the clock for a while, waiting for the right time to ask about picking up some herb from them, and while I'm waiting, they get out this huge, long pipe and start smoking out of that too. By the time I'd taken a turn on the pipe, I was absolutely blasted. They kept insisting I take deeper and deeper pulls too, until my throat was so dry that I was practically begging for a sip of their rum just to stop from coughing. But as you can imagine, that only made me feel worse, and not long after... I decided I needed to get out of there before I puked. But obviously I can't leave until I get my smoke. I might not get another chance, I thought. At least, that's how my young, dumb, intoxicated mind saw it. So as I get up, swaying a little from all the drinking and smoking, I ask the guys if they have anything to sell. One of them says, sure, stands up, and leads me into the house behind them. 
I follow him up on some stairs and we're talking prices the whole time, all in US dollars of course, which I figured would make a transaction more attractive. Then, we get up into an upstairs room that looked like it was just used for storage. There's all kinds of broken furniture all over the place, a busted fridge, loose piping, all sorts of junk. Made sense to stash their stuff there, I suppose, but when the guy stops me and tells me to close my eyes, I start thinking that something is a little sketchy. Uh, why? I remember asking. Got a sample for you, something special. Gonna open your mind to the truth, you get me? I'm suitably convinced, nervous, but convinced nonetheless. So I close my eyes and I feel as the guy puts something cold and metallic against my mouth. I assume it's another pipe, so I start like dragging on it. I was high as a kite, okay? Before I hear the guy start to laugh this horrible, sinister laugh, I open my eyes, and it's not the mouthpiece of a pipe I've got between my lips. It's a single barrel shotgun, and for all I know, it's loaded. I just stand there, frozen to the spot as the guy is laughing at me. Should know better than to walk up in a strange man's house, white boy. Then using the barrel that's in my mouth to, like, push me, he moves me back towards the door and down the stairs again, all with the gun in my mouth. Now you're probably thinking, but there's no way you could have had it in your mouth the whole time, moving around corridors and down staircases, and you'd be 100% correct. Because any time the barrel slipped out of my mouth, cutting at the corners of my mouth or smashing into one of my teeth as it did, the guy would always shout like, put your mouth back on it white boy. I was almost in tears by the time we got back out into the yard, and the guy's buddy started rolling on the floor laughing at me. The next thing I start hearing is, shoo them, take a med right off now. And to my absolute pant-wetting horror, the guy starts to count to three. As soon as I hear the three, I just act, like I legit didn't even think about it. I didn't run at first because I figured the guy would just shoot me if I tried, but now he seemed to actually be planning on it. It just made sense to die running away than to die just standing there like a coward. I heard them laughing again as I ran, and I was so messed up that I face planted multiple times as I ran down their fairly gentle slope and back towards downtown Montego Bay. And I spent the remainder of the day trying to get sober and stable enough to go back to the resort without my parents realizing that something had happened. I should probably make it clear at this point that, apart from that one horrific incident, everyone else in Jamaica was perfectly friendly and welcoming. And I hate to sound like I'm blaming anyone but me here, but Jamaicans being so friendly to tourists is maybe what lulled me into a false sense of security in the first place. My mom and dad still don't know that all this happened to me all these years later. But I figured they suspect something as for the rest of the vacation, I was content to chill at the resort and only go into downtown Montego whenever they were going too. The point is, if you're young and planning on doing any traveling or whatever. Don't be as dumb, rude, or as naive as me. You can only coast on your own charm and the kindness of strangers for so long. And if you go looking for trouble, you might just find it. While the Caribbean is mostly known for its white sandy beaches, crystal blue waters, and eponymous pirates, there is another area of the Caribbean that's synonymous with paranormal phenomenon and bizarre disappearances. Named for the island at its northeastern tip, strange occurrences are so common in the region that its name is often greeted with flippancy or indifference, but one particular incident caused the single biggest non-combat loss of life in U.S. naval history. So perhaps we should start paying a little more attention and take a deep dive into the curse and causes of the Bermuda Triangle. Although the phenomenon has only had a name for the past 70 years or so, incidents in the Triangle obviously go back hundreds of years. The first official mention of bizarre disappearances occurring in the Caribbean appeared in the Miami Herald in September of 1950, although it would take two more years for an article in Fate magazine entitled Sea Mystery at Her Back Door. 
It's this short article by journalist George Sand that lays out the basis of the Bermuda Triangle theories that persist to this day. He explores the loss of several planes and ships, including the loss of Flight 19, a group of five U.S. Navy torpedo bombers that disappeared while on a routine training mission in the region. Sands was also the first to lay out the now familiar triangular area where the losses took place, as well as the first to suggest a supernatural explanation for the disappearances. The Flight 19 incident would be covered again in a 1962 issue of the American Legion magazine, with the author reporting that the flight leader had been heard saying over his radio, we are entering white water. Nothing seems right. We don't know where we are. The water is green, no, no white. They also reported that the Navy Board of Inquiry stated that the planes flew off to Mars. Regarding Flight 19, what we know for certain is that the five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers took off on December 5th, 1945, never to land again. The squadron's flight plan took them east from Fort Lauderdale for 141 miles, north for around 70, and then back over a final 145-mile leg to complete the exercise. But as we well know at this point, neither the planes nor the pilots were ever seen again. The U.S. Navy initially put this down to either a manual navigation error, resulting in a total loss of fuel, and sent a PBM Mariner aircraft in search of them. However, when the plane and its 13 crew also seemed to drop off the face of the earth, it became clear that something was horribly wrong. Historians have suggested that a fault with the Mariner's engine caused it to tragically and unexpectedly explode in mid-air. But having a five-plane flight and its follow-up search and rescue craft disappear in the space of a few hours? That seems like far too much of a coincidence for anyone with even the hint of a curious mind. As we've already stated, there have been a number of bizarre disappearances in the Triangle. The earliest known dates all the way back to October 11th of 1492, when Christopher Columbus and the crew of Santa Maria reported a sighting of unknown light, just days before landing at Guanahani. In the 19th century, numerous ships were either found abandoned or disappeared completely, and with the advent of the airplane, the same phenomenon began to occur with those two. But the incident we'll focus on today involves the disappearance of the USS Cyclops, the single biggest non-combat loss of life in U.S. naval history. The USS Cyclops set sail for Rio de Janeiro on February 16th of 1918, carrying manganese ore up to Baltimore. Aside from a brief stop to take on supplies in the Brazilian city of Salvador, the Cyclops continued on its way with no other scheduled stops. It has since been suggested that the Cyclops was overloaded, since an unscheduled stop had to be made in Barbados due to an unusually high waterline. But records back in Rio showed that the ship had been loaded and secured in line with contemporary safety measures. The only confirmed mechanical flaw in the Cyclops was arguably insignificant, with an officer submitting a report that the starboard engine had a cracked cylinder and was not operative. This report was confirmed by a survey boat which deemed the inoperative engine to be no great threat to the ship's safety and recommended that the ship be returned to the United States immediately. For some reason, a rumor went around that the Cyclops was sighted on March 9th by the captain of a molasses tanker near the coast of Virginia. Despite being widely reported, the rumor was completely denied by the captain of the Amoco, who said he'd seen no such ship and had no idea why anyone would say otherwise. On top of that, because Cyclops was not due in Baltimore until March 13th, it would be highly improbable that the ship was anywhere near Virginia on the day in question. Yet in any case, Cyclops never arrived in Baltimore, and despite numerous extensive search and rescue operations, no wreckage of the ship was ever found. And on June 1st of 1918, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, declared Cyclops to be officially lost, and all 306 hands deceased. The nation mourned the tragic loss of life, but questions as to the Cyclops' fate remained. One possible explanation for the Cyclops' disappearance is the violent storm which swept through the Virginia Capes area around March 10th, 
just three days before she was due to arrive back into port. A violent storm would obviously overload an already troubled ship and may well account for the sinking and subsequent disappearance of the Cyclops. However, the extensive naval investigation that followed concluded that many theories have been advanced, but none that satisfactorily accounts for the Cyclops' disappearance. This summation was written, however, before two of Cyclops' sister ships, Proteus and Nereus, vanished at sea during World War II. Both ships were transporting heavy loads of metallic ore similar to that which was loaded on Cyclops during her fatal voyage. In both cases, their loss was theorized to have been the result of catastrophic structural failure, but some aren't satisfied with such an answer, insisting the common thread that runs between the ships isn't so much identical structural problems, but the fact that all three ships were sailing in the Bermuda Triangle at the time they disappeared. Both scientists and historians have put forward theories which attempt to explain such a strange and consistent phenomenon. One of the most cited explanations in official inquiries as to the loss of any aircraft or vessel is human error, or perhaps even human stubbornness in the case of businessman Harvey Conover. The wealthy entrepreneur sailed right into a storm south of Florida on January 1st, 1958, determined to enjoy his new yacht, the Revenac. In the end, he lost his boat and his life. The Gulf Stream has also been cited as a possible contributing factor. Often described as a river within an ocean, a small plane making a water landing or a boat having an engine trouble can be carried far, far away from its reported position by the current. A vessel could suffer some kind of catastrophe, be shifted upstream, then the responding rescuers simply look in the wrong place. It sounds like a solid theory, but it's still highly unlikely that three large cargo vessels could all vanish without a trace, and in exactly the same way. Another explanation for some of the disappearances has focused on bizarre, terrifying, and very natural phenomenon known as methane eruptions, or simply mud volcanoes. It has been hypothesized that periodic methane eruptions may produce regions of frothy water that are no longer capable of providing adequate buoyancy for ships. If this were the case, such an area forming around a ship could cause it to sink very rapidly and without warning, a terrifying prospect akin to an airplane just dropping out of the sky. Reports from the U.S. Geological Society describe large stores of undersea hydrates worldwide, including areas off the coast of the southeastern United States. However, the U.S. Geological Society has also said that no large releases of methane are believed to have occurred in the so-called Bermuda Triangle for the past 15,000 years. Similar to mud eruptions, another less known meteorological phenomenon might also be to blame, one that scientists have called air bombs. A powerful downdraft of cold air was suspected to be a cause in the sinking of Pride of Baltimore on May 14, 1986, with the crew of the sunken vessel noting that the wind suddenly and violently increased in velocity. Dr. James Lushine, an expert in rare weather events, stated that during very unstable weather conditions, the downburst of cold air from a loft can hit the surface like a bomb, exploding outward like a giant squall line of wind and water. And as we've heard, there are many natural, plausible explanations for things that occurred in the Bermuda Triangle. But there are less conventional scholars who insist that paranormal occurrences are to blame for the disappearances. One explanation cites UFO activity for the mysterious vanishings, while another pins the blame on leftover technology from the mystical lost city of Atlantis. Followers of the purported psychic Edgar Case takes his prediction that evidence of Atlantis will be found in 1968. One of his works can be quoted as saying, while the ruined temples now play host to multitudinous underwater creatures, the great Atlantean fire crystals that once provided so much of the tremendous power and energy that was found in Atlantis still exist. Case also frequently alluded to the discovery of the Bimini Road, a natural rock formation on the Caribbean seabed. Believers describe the formation as a road, wall, or other structure, but the Bimini Road is proven to be of natural origin, 
so the theory hardly makes sense at all in the context of a man or rather Atlantean-made structure. What's clear is that even after a sizable amount of research, it's not entirely certain what's causing the disappearances of ships and aircraft in the Bermuda Triangle. Despite a variety of natural and unnatural possibilities being suggested, it's hard to pin down exactly which is true without any physical evidence being recovered. Obviously, the supernatural explanations make for a terrifying prospect, but even the natural ones are utterly horrifying. Imagine your ship suddenly sinking for no apparent reason, plunging you and hundreds of your crewmates to the bottom of the ocean in a freak mud volcano, or your airplane being blasted out of the sky by one of those air bombs. It just goes to show that nature itself can be far more terrifying and deadly than any supernatural explanation, and that pointing towards the lost city of Atlantis, or UFOs, adds a little wonder and excitement to something that would otherwise be soul-crushingly meaningless and random. So just remember, the next time you're on that Caribbean cruise, or flying out to Jamaica to soak up the sun, if the weather starts to take a turn for the worse, or the ship starts to sink a little lower in the water, you might just about be the next victim of the Bermuda Triangle. In the year 1982, in the market of a small Haitian town known as Listera, a man approached a woman and greeted her warmly, as if he hadn't seen her in a rather long time. The woman simply stared back at him in shock, not saying a word. One could consider this rather unusual as the pair were in fact brother and sister, and it's true that they hadn't seen each other in quite some time. The man identified himself once again and asked his sister why she wasn't pleased to see him, but when onlookers heard the man's name, terror and panic spread through the marketplace. You see, this man's name was Clervius Narcisse, and he had been buried in the local cemetery 18 years before that day. At around the same time, a man named Wade Davis was studying for a PhD in ethnobotany at Harvard. His study of psychoactive plants used among the various native tribes of the Americas had taken him all over Central and Southern America, as well as the Caribbean. And now he was being called upon to join his old college professor in a rather unusual task. When asked if he could leave for the island nation of Haiti in the next 14 days, he replied in the affirmative, not wishing to miss out on something so mysterious and alluring. Two days later, Davis met with Dr. Nathan Klein in a Manhattan apartment, where he was handed the death certificate of one Clarius Narcisse, dated March 2nd of 1962. They were about to try their hand at solving the mystery of a man who'd come back from the dead. On the night of the 30th of April, 1962, a then 40-year-old Clarius Narcisse checked himself into a hospital, complaining of fevers, an aching body, and blood in his saliva. A few days later, he was pronounced dead by both an American and a Haitian doctor. Two of his sisters bore witness to his body, which was then buried on May the 3rd. After his apparent resurrection, Clervius claimed that one of his brothers had a zombie curse put on him in retaliation for a land dispute. After being buried, he had been resurrected shortly after before being flogged, tied up, and taken away to work as a slave in the northern region of Haiti. There he worked the land as a brain-dead slave for the next two years, until the death of the master broke his spell. He claimed to have stayed away from Lestier for the next 16 years in fear of his brother, but then chose to return after hearing of his death. Upon greeting her in the market that day, his sister didn't give him anything like the reaction he'd been hoping for. She later said she noticed a scar on his cheek from where 18 years prior a misplaced nail had caught his skin at his coffin lid and been hammered shut. She offered him money and told him to leave. Wade Davis had concluded that an African plant, Datora stramonium, could have been used as the basis of a poison and could have been introduced to Haiti along with the African traditions. Datora stramonium could be used in a concoction that, when rubbed on the skin, would have a variety of effects including hallucinations, delusions, confusion, 
disorientation and amnesia. In large doses, it could fell a human in a numb stupor or even result in death. On his arrival in Haiti, David met with a man by the name of Max Beauvoir. Beauvoir was an expert in Haitian voodoo and warned Davis that his search for the zombie person would be fruitless, as it wasn't the poison which made the zombie, but a voodoo priest known as Bokor. Davis was then invited to witness one of his more tourist-friendly voodoo ceremonies later that evening, and later said he was fascinated by the mambo, or voodoo priestess, who drew symbols on the ground to invoke spirits while wailing and chanting echoed around the village. Davis's next stop was to meet with Marcel Pierre, a voodoo priest who he was assured could create a zombie. He told him that his backers in America could pay him thousands upon thousands if the poison were real, for they were interested in its possible pharmaceutical uses, and after a bit of bravado between the men, Marcel Pierre, who had initially resisted the idea, finally agreed to make a zombie poison. The ingredients turned to be highly gruesome and included digging the body of a three-year-old child from her grave. They worked by night, and after they had rubbed an oily substance on their skin, Pierre crushed the head of the decaying child's corpse open with his hands and added the rotten contents into a mixture containing plants, the carcass of a toad, and large sea worm that had previously been placed inside a jar together and buried in the ground until the creature had died from rage. Several fish that had been placed on a grill to burn were added and the whole thing was crushed into a powder, poured into a glass jar, placed into the coffin with the corpse of the child, and buried in the ground of Marcel Pierre's temple for three days. Finally, Davis had his poison, but just says before his return to America, and quite coincidentally, Davis was out on a walk when he stumbled upon a field of plants that he recognized. It was an entire field of Datura stramonium. After Davis returned to Harvard, he immediately sent his poison to the laboratory along with specimens of the ingredients for toxicology analysis. His results were fascinating. He found that the plants all had physiological effects, leading to rashes, sores, and skin irritations. The toad contained a multitude of poisons, but importantly, all symptoms matched with the symptoms of Clavius Narcisse showed before his death. The addition of the sea worm made logical sense, as the toad would secrete more of its toxins if it felt threatened. So by placing the creatures together in a jar and burying them, they were not simply dying of rage, but the toad was being coerced into creating a hazardous amount of toxin before its death simply by the presence of the worm in the jar. The real breakthrough came with the fish, however. The species used in the poison was blowfish or puffer. The poison of the blowfish, tetrodotoxin, is one of the most poisonous toxins known. Its effects include reduction of temperature, a prickling sensation leading to numbness, often giving the feeling of floating, paralysis, and glassy eyes, eventually leading to a comatose state. However, full consciousness is retained until either the victim of the poison dies or recovers, depending on the dosage. This would not only explain why Narcisse could remember everything about his death, but also explain how it could have actually appeared dead to the physicians in the hospital. Davis researched the pufferfish's poison and found several cases of people dying, only to miraculously return to life on their way to the morgue. The plants were used as an irritant, a way in which to create a sore and open wound which would allow the toxins to reach the bloodstream. It was genius. It all made so much sense. What had seemed phony and random had turned out to be an actual recipe for creating living zombies. Now that Davis had a grasp on the proclivities of zombification, he was driven to understand the meaning and through his search discovered the Bazongo, secret voodoo societies, a trace of lineage of rites and rituals descending from the hidden groups of escaped slaves during colonial French rule. These groups of men and women, enacting out their cultural traditions in the mountains, would eventually form a militia that played a forefront role in the fighting of the rebellion. Now, these traditions survived as secret religious sects, meeting in shadowy temples during the black of night submitting offerings into coffins lit by firelight as drums rattle and priests sing. The Bazongo both protect and police their own communities, 
As Davis was told directly during his time in Haiti, a bazongo can be sweet as honey and bitter as bile, and zombification is something of a form of capital punishment from the bazongo. Narcisse knew he had wronged the community and understood his punishment in the context of voodoo. He accepted his fate as a zombie and, as voodoo dictates, he had become the very thing that is so utterly feared by societies all over the world. The Walking Dead. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream on random Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.